says is live. Is it? Yeah, it's saying that we live, but still there is some kind of delay. So maybe we, we can wait for 20 seconds and it should be live. Okay. It's too late. Oh, yeah, we are live. Uh, oh, so cool. uh, great to see you all back from your coffee break. And we're going to go with our next speaker. Um, it will be Maria Filipova, and she will be talking about uh, Don't Take It to the Heart, Protection Service, Excellence, and Agent Well Being Through All This Support Drama. And please, uh, I'm giving the word to you, so let, let's move. Thank you very much. One of the longest, uh, long, longest titles from the conference, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I work for a customer service provider. Uh, oh, we do other stuff as well, but game support is our first and longest passion. Uh, so everything I'm going to talk about today will be based on what we have observed during the last 12 years. Um, I'm a quality assurance and education lead. Uh, me and my colleagues analyze user agent user interactions to make sure they remain top notch and also help our agents strengthen their soft skills. Uh, so our task is to ensure the best possible service for the users and at the same time help our agents to be both productive and comfortable while doing their job. And this is essentially what I'll be going to talk about today of this balance between having excellent customer service and taking care of your support agents. So we all know how important customer service is for the success of the project and everybody is talking about it and through the years customer service professionals have been endowed with more and more responsibility and thus more and more pressure. But since the current culture is predominantly positivity centric, it is unavoidable that people talk more about the like the prettier side of the job and less attention is being paid to the uglier side of this equation. Basically, what can happen during these user support interactions and how tricky these interactions can actually be. And um, I suggest we discuss what happens be behind these close support doors and what we can do to keep our service excellent and our customer service specialists well-being as protected as we can. I mean, uh, game support is probably one of the most toxic areas, honestly. Uh, we support both games and apps and we can compare. Um, Game support agents are much more prone to burnout and all these unpleasant symptoms it is associated with. And it is bad for the specialists, of course, because they can really suffer from it. And it is bad for the company because it is difficult for agents with a burnout to uphold the supreme quality of customer service. And agents are more likely to leave. And uh, so which may create a turnover and you will have to spend more on hiring processes. And if you onboard and you train your agents, uh, if you put a lot of resources into them, every loss of a specialist will, will be felt even more keenly. And frankly, it does not really depend much on the game genre. I mean, there are differences and peculiarities in communication naturally, but all of them, like hardcore, needcore, various casual, hybrid casual games, they're full of mind numbing examples of what can be well, cautiously called difficult conversations. And we shall now look at these examples and see what we can do about it. Uh, I will divide these difficult conversations into different categories and spice them up a little bit with real life examples without uh, revealing any private information naturally. And we shall go through these categories and look at some general workflows that you can use to deal with it and then focus uh, more on the agent's well-being. 
So here's the first one. Well, something that probably springs to mind when you're talking about unpleasantness in game support is angry customers and an excessive amount of swearing. Uh, it is really not rare for agents to receive like a long lump of text where like 70 or 80 percent of all the words will be swear words. And the rest of the words will be articles, conjunctions and prepositions. And this simply, this gen genuinely can read like a sweary poem or some, of some kind. And usually these are more characteristics, characteristic to hardcore and nitcore games with, uh, you know, this adrenaline infusing mechanics. It is easy to imagine a person thrashing their opponents on a battle arena or trying desperately to win some car race. And suddenly the game crashes. And if you are a hot-tempered person, an impassioned player, you might see how they feel necessary to express their discontent. And then there is this internet anonymity thing, of course. You would be very, very careful about swearing at a random stranger in a shop. However, internet kind of protects us, well, sort of, and sometimes gamers feel free to express their feelings as they choose. Sometimes they also feel like uh, the developers like own them something uh, for the fact they're playing the game, especially if they put money into the game. Not necessarily a lot of money. Uh, sometimes even a, a user who paid like a couple of dollars will literally throw it in, in your face from the beginning and use it for some basis for being really, really disrespectful. Now, um, how bad is this for support agents? Well, um, it depends really, uh, because very often these swearing messages are not personal. And swear words are used more as intensifiers, as an insult. Frankly, sometimes it is more amusing than insulting. And, well, you definitely enlarge your vocabulary, that's for sure. As a company, you need to know when to take a stand, though. So will you allow any swearing at all? Will you reject any request that contains offensive language? Or will you draw the line at some personalized abuse? We've seen both approaches at work, and frankly, we believe that this sliding line is kind of better working at this instance. Uh, for those who use swearing as intensifiers, it is quite possible to make them change their ways uh, once this initial wave of anger is over. Um, you can use a well-crafted warning and then add some genuine attention to their problem, and these can rather quickly calm them down and remind them that there are also human beings on the other side of the screen. Personalized insults are not that easy to turn around. And frankly, most of the time, they might not deserve this attention anyway. What you do need to remember that even though people can get used to most things, being exposed to this barrage of personalized insults can have a very detrimental effect on your supporters. Next comes psychological abuse. This is basically ugly stuff without swearing. And it is worse than swearing, far worse. Uh, such things are more rare because they cannot be produced by simple anger. But they can really get to you. Uh, something like describing how all your relatives will die of horrible diseases and rot underground, eaten by worms, is beyond creepy, honestly. And this was almost a quote. We believe this isn't something that a company needs to put up with, frankly. 
and boundaries have to be set here. See, these cases, they're not so numerous. And if you reject these requests, you won't lose much. Uh, however, it will mean a lot to your support. Because this type of user, though, it doesn't bring a lot of value to the company or to the game process. They can drag the conversation for months. It's, 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 li it's literally like sucking the air out of the room. Next thing is an interesting kind of issue, and we can call it a mass protest. It's when players gather together on some forums or in chat rooms beyond your control and realize they wish to influence the developer. Then they form some kind of a strategy and they create, for example, a common message and each of them will send it from their own account to the support, like a sort of petition, or they can even declare them a sort of organization. Um, why it can be hard for the agents? Because these players are persistent. They would return again and again. Their leaders may address you separately, trying to reinforce these claims. And they are usually heavy payers. And you need to keep the balance here. Like you don't want to lose this business, all of this business, all of these paying customers, but still you need to resolve the situation somehow. And maybe you, sometimes you may need to think outside the box. Like one of our clients uh, has got a hit game that has a very loyal pool of admirers. And quite a large number of them got together, and created a kind of a forum thing with their own leader. And they were greatly concerned about the future development of the game, the future development of certain uh, game mechanics. And most of them are whales. The amount of messages they, collect, they collectively send to, to support is frankly beyond count at this point. And they can share every message they receive from the support and they don't and they didn't use to listen to reason at all really and it was really really draining when they uh, organized this campaign huge campaign um so you know give it a thought what would you do in this kind of a situation in our example, the developers decided on some, well, interesting measures. They invited the leader of the group into one of the company offices. They gave them a tour and they told them about the general development plans for the game. And this attention is flattering, very flattering. Um, they didn't stop sending tons of letters, but their stance changed greatly from you know battle stations to cooperation and solution seeking and their leader turned more into a judicator and a peacemaker the next type that uh, can also be quite tricky and these are those users who trim to treat customer support as a general helpline mm. These players often use the game as, as some kind of an escapist mechanism, a way of distancing themselves from their everyday life problems. And they can form a very strong attachment to the game and transfer this attachment to game support. And they often write about, not about their like game issues, but about their everyday life some troubles at work, uh, some personal problems, problems with their health. And sometimes it can be quite serious and troubling for the agents. So here you need to devise uh, a two-sided plan. Firstly, yes, these issues have nothing to do with the project. Uh, but you see, your users will be forever loyal if you treat them right in such a situation. And on the other hand, your agents are not specially trained uh, professionals, like not specially trained psychologists who can provide professional help 
in these difficult life situations. And often the situations that Blaise described, they, they do clearly require some professional assistance. So what you need here is a clear workflow, a clear algorithm for the agents. So which issues they can mention in a response, which they can glide over with some more general phrases. And they will benefit from uh, a large selection of these appropriate phrases that they can adapt for each individual case. They also need to know uh, what they have to do with the most extreme cases. Uh, for example, one of our clients had a special provision for the requests where players mention suicide. So this is like one of the most serious issues there can be. And your support agents, they can't take, take it on alone. So what can we do to help our agents? generally, to improve their ex experience and their existence and every ev everyday work. Um, first, what you really need to implement, if you don't have this already, is a joint environment where agents can come together, discuss problematic cases, share tips, and basically support each other. And isolation in such a job will increase frustration enormously. And it is quite possible to create the atmosphere of camaraderie, even in a fully remote environment when the, the, the whole team is from all over the world. Um, then they, they need uh, some easy way to reach their leads. And they also need to feel that they are always free to raise any questions with the management. Um, that there is no disconnect and that they are heard and not dismissed and not put in some box or other. So on the one hand, it is if you want uh, an outlet for venting. But on the other hand, you show them respect that they may lack from the users that they face every day. Also, you can make it clear if there is any career development available, because uh, there, there are a few things worse than toiling on a psychologically demanding job without any prospects or without even understanding if there are any prospects at all. Um, then, of course, you can give them a shoulder to lean on. We find that a mechanism where an agent can ask for assistance is very helpful for them. And they should be able not to just ask what to reply, like about some game mechanics, but also how to reply. In our case, agents can not only go to the project leads, but also to the QA crowd, my lot. Uh, they're the experts on how, and they can always offer a way to resolve a conflict within a dialogue. Then, of course, there is training. There are several uh, aspects that will be useful to your agents here. So firstly, um, quality agent onboarding reduces stress a lot and reinforces the culture of cooperation between agents. Um, then we do the soft skill training. But it's not just what we tell them again, uh, you know, like various techniques and stuff, but also how we tell them. Maybe you notice when I was explaining uh, before the, cat the categories before, I, I also mentioned how a player's brain might work in different situations. And this is a really important part. This is how you give this kind of information. Bef before I explain a technique, I explain the premise. I explain it to them so they don't need to take that journey all by themselves in each complicated situation. And this saves them a lot, a lot of resources. So basically, I empathize so that they, they could address their, this, this situation with rationality rather than pure empathy. Because pure empathy is a tricky thing. It can be unreliable. It produces plenty of cognition biases and it is very demanding. And research shows that among those people who deal with the crisis, people who rely on empathy alone burn out faster. 
when people who rely on more, on, more on rational compassion hold on longer and can provide quality assistance to people for longer. And I'm here with Paul Bloom, the author, uh, who says that rational compassion is preferable in such circumstances. It helps agents stay more productive for longer. They assess the situation rationally. They know what to pay attention to, what techniques to use, uh, how they can achieve a better result with minimum damage to themselves. Then uh, there is also the question of the material that uh, we use in training. We've always tried to make it as diverse as possible. We concentrate on the skills we need to enhance, but we don't tie it down only to the situations that they can face at work. And variety here boosts imagination and allows agents to take a break from their repetitive everyday tasks. Um, we've also practiced a certain exercise. Well, it's your basic role play. Um, when one person takes the role of an agent, the another person takes the role of the user. Um, then they switch places. But the special additive that we devised is that the agent has got a very special script. And this script may demand them, as they're playing the role of an agent, to respond, well, badly poorly. And we have found the whole thing very therapeutic. On the one hand, our agents get to release all the bottled emotions when they're playing like a bad agent. On the other hand, those on the receiving end of such treatment can identify themselves with the users and feel how terrible it may be when you receive this terrible reply or how pleased they feel when they receive a well-crafted response. And uh, we've also started adding some training exercises that are aimed at the agent's psychological well-being. Uh, so we don't simply describe what they can do to feel better. You know, like psychologists usually say, go for a walk, have a nice sleep, that sort of thing. But we also organize some actual practices where they can work with boost a bit of their self-esteem maybe to uh, support each other, to cooperate, to talk, um, and they're being quite hit with the agents. And uh, the last recommendation is, if it is possible, of course, on your project, is to give uh, agents some maybe additional tasks. It's not just about Again, responsibility, but it's about variety. For example, uh, you can ask them to create some response templates for certain common situations. And this will allow them to be creative in some way. And a creative outlet is a great preventer of the advance in burnout. So to conclude, to sum it up, so the more successful approach to the user support is the one that, yes, prioritizes exceptional service, but also includes a kind of an ecosystem that also protects our agents' well-being. Um, you know, there's a saying, who watches the watchers? And we need to consider something similar here, who supports the supporters? And by creating an, an environment, a supportive environment, and implementing some strategies to um, address these difficult, challenging interactions, we ultimately improve the whole customer service process because we can ensure that our teams remain resilient and deliver outstanding support. And we have noticed that we enjoy a very low turnover and uh, people can stay and work as agents for several years, which is sometimes not very characteristic for the whole role. So it definitely works. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. If there are... 
Thank you, Maria, for, for your presentation. Uh, maybe we will see some questions just a second. And how, how can I open it up? Uh, so guys, if you have 